me start off with uh, what I have as an illustration in the beginning. There's a story of a person who decided, I mean, he, I mean, who could not decide to, who could not decide which side he has to fight for. So during the Civil War, this is an American story. So what he did was he put on the coat of the North and the trousers of the South. And you know what happened? He got shot from both sides. Okay? So that is the condition of living a compromised life. So that is what we are going to look tonight in this evening. Uh, I'll try and keep it very simple. Now, so, compromised Christian living. Sadly, you know, the church is also going through such a such a state in, in these days. And the Bible gives us an example in the Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 2. You know, you don't need to open it, I'll just say. I'm specifically referring about the church at Pergamum. You know, the, uh, Pergamum was the capital city of Asia Minor at that point of time. And uh, wickedness, sexual immorality were the commonplace, were commonplace at, you know, in there, there. And the problem with the church was that this church tolerated all of these evil. And thus, the Lord comes to John, you know, Revelation chapter 2, verse 16. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He, his hand is very clear, you know. The compromised person, this is, I mean, he is very tough on compromise. Now, fast forward 2019 years, today, the believers, all of us, I mean, there are some places where we compromise. You know, some of them, you know, they want to go to church, and they, they go to the church, but they would do it when they when they think about it. They certainly want to go to heaven, but they still want to live in sin. They want to party, sin, commit adultery, immorality, and lie when necessary, cheat if they can, and and you know, and steal if it suits them, hate, and get revenge, get even with people. That's how you know some of us are. I'm not speaking about anybody specific here, but there's a general condition that, that can be observed. If Jesus was to speak to our church, you know, everybody who's attending now, he wouldn't be speaking anything different. He would be see, saying exactly what he said to the church at Pergamon. He will come to us quickly and fight them with the sword of the mouth. See, what we are dealing with is really serious. Compromise. Now, but another condition with the church today is, you know, we, I mean, they would say, but this is not the Jesus that we know. This is not the one that we are familiar with from the pulpit. Yes, it's true. They have been fed the image of an idol. It is an image that they have made for themselves, while Jesus doesn't look anything like what is in that in that picture. He is the jealous God, He is the holy God, He is the most high God, you know, and He is righteous. That is who He is. Now, I am not suggesting that, you know, uh, we should live uh, like, you know, I am holier than you with that, that attitude. That's not, that's not what I am saying. But, definitely, you know, it should come to a point when people would look at us and say, are there something different about that person? There's something good I can pursue. I tell you, you know those people who would who would look at us and probably jeer at us or or make sly snide uh, remarks or you know um, sometimes taunt us. Though they do that, deep in their heart they are very much convicted about who we are, about the Christians. That there's something so good and right about them that. Okay, I need to look hard. Maybe there's something that I can learn from that person. 
that is what we are, that is how we are. It is, it should be our effort according to, I mean, with the help of our Holy, our, our, the Holy Spirit, you know, to live that, that, that beautiful life. Now, compromise. We were talking about compromise. You know, it's, it starts when there is a breakdown in our relationship with our Lord. That is when it happens. Now, there are three ways in which, you know, we can live as Christians in this world. I mean, in the context, I'm trying to, you know, expound this. There are three ways. One is, you can live separate from the world. Like, uh, yeah, you can live up on a holy mountain, Christians, holy, not touched by the world. You can live up there, or in a holy bunker, in a cave where nobody knows, nothing reaches you. But then, that is not what the word expects us to do. What about the Great Commission? How do we do that unless we get in contact with the world? How do we get, you know, give out this message if we don't come out and live in the world? So the first option is not, it's not there, it is out of question. The second way is to live in the world separate, according to the scripture, proclaiming it. That is what we are expected to do. We are living, we are placed in wherever we are. Here we are placed in Nero. We are placed here and yet we are supposed to live by the scripture and according to, you know, his, his leading, that's what we have to do. And that fulfills, that fulfills his purpose, right? Matthew 10, 16. This is, what, this is a beautiful picture of what uh, the Lord says. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. That's how we are to be, okay? As Christians, that's how we are to be. Now, another, another portion I would, I would like to read. Uh, John chapter 17, verses 14 to 16. We know this is the prayer that Jesus makes. I have given them your word. Jesus is praying to his Father in heaven and he is remembering each of us, Christians, followers of Christ. He's remembering each of us in his prayer. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So, two things, we are not of the world, as he is not of the world, and who keeps us? The Lord keeps us from the evil one. That is the way we are to live, okay? And this is the prayer that Jesus prays for each of us. That is what he does. Do you, I mean, we have to live in the light of this particular truth. I'm moving on. Uh, there are enough number of verses, you know, one can quote on this subject, especially uh, Romans 12, 2. You do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Enough number of verses from the, from the scripture that, uh, that ask us to live that life that is separate and not a compromising one. Now the third way to live, I said the first one was to live separately, away on a holy mountain or in a bunker. Second is to live as what God asked us to do. The third way is what we are discussing today, that to live as compromised Christians. Now, um, to discuss this idea, I want to uh, take you through the life of a person. Uh, we are quite familiar with that guy from the Bible. He was a king. Now, um, before I get into it, let me, let me tell you, if we are compromised in our lives as Christians, be sure something is around the way, you know, around, around the way, around the corner. You're living your life as Christians, you go down the way, when you take that turn, something is going to hit you because you have not been living true to the way you have been called. Okay? Be sure about that. Now, the, this guy's life will explain why that is true. 
I'm talking about King Jehoshaphat. I'm sure you all, you all understood, you have read about him. This is this, uh, this, this, this episode in his life that is described in chapter 18 of Second Chronicles. That's just for your reference. And I'll just go through what he went through. He was a godly man. King Jehoshaphat was a godly man. And he was the king of Judah. You know there are two kingdoms at that point of time. Israel, the, the entire tribe, the, the whole tribe of Israel, they had split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. This man, Jehoshaphat, was the king of, a, of the southern kingdom. And his contemporary at that point of time was King Ahab. Ahab, you know. So that is the scenario. Now when you look at Jehoshaphat's life, he was a man of utmost diligence in the matters of that, you know, and concerning God. He had brought about radical changes in the land of Judah, in the kingdom of Judah. He brought down uh, idolatry. He came crashing in on idol heavy. He came heavily down on idolatry. He purged the land, and there was a revival. You know, meaning people came back to the back to the living God, and he fervently sought the Lord in his in his in his you know endeavors in, in his military feats. And God gave him his victory. You know, that's how he lived as the king of uh, Judah. Now, so you have to understand this guy was not an average believer. I mean, at parlance, you know, of today's Christian. He was not an average believer. He was the man who did things. Okay. He was the king. But he too slept. So there's a word of caution here. If somebody like Jehoshaphat can slip, there is high chance that we too can be on our guard. Now, compromise, you know that the whole operation works very subtly. You, would, you, would, you wouldn't even know that there, is, there, has been, there has been a compromise. That is how it works. Jehoshaphat, you know, he, he um, when he was in, in, uh, reigning in the kingdom of Judah, a point of time came when his neighbor, his, his contemporary in the northern kingdom, King Ahab, the notorious guy, he came forward with a, with, with a plan. I mean, he came with a proposal. You know what the proposal was? That Jehoshaphat's son marry his daughter. Okay? Now, because Jehoshaphat was, you know, he was, he was successful in what he was doing, for a, for a, you know, for at this point he faltered. He said, "Okay." He considered that. He did not understand that as a bait the enemy and the enemy was bringing. Aha said, "Hey, um, why don't we have get into this alliance?" To which he said, "Yes." You know, but Jehoshaphat. I mean, he should have thought about who Ahab was. What was his wife's name? Jezebel. The wicked lady, the wicked queen. In the, in the spiritual warfare, you know, uh, that realm, that, that subject, we have something called as a Jezebel spirit. You know? So he was overlooking a serious problem there. Let me move on. The wedding happened. You know? So now, once they are family, what happens? There would be scenarios where you can, you cannot say no. I mean, you would not, you would agree two things. You would go there, you would sit with them, you would dine with them. So things began begin began to happen. So one day, Jehoshaphat was subtly forced by King Ahab to get into a military feat, you know, to go up against Ramoth Galiah. You know, there was this the attack that he was planning. Long story short, in the battle, Jehoshaphat almost got himself killed. You know the story. And what happened to Ahab? He lost, he paid with his life in the same battle. Okay? So, look at what compromise did to uh, King uh, Jehoshaphat. And you know, it 
was very disastrous how he, he, he met with his fate. King Ahab was in the battlefield and some uh, soldier, he just pulled out his weapon and it pierced through Ahab's armor, armor, right? The armor. And he was left bleeding and he died at sunset in the battlefield. How pathetic. How pathetic. Uh, Jehoshaphat almost got himself killed. Now you put ourselves in that situation. I mean, I want to speak especially with the youngsters here. Uh, compromise doesn't come up with a, with a great, great bright face. Okay? I mean, a loud face, it doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. It comes in very sly. You wouldn't even know what is happening. Okay? Like, for example, I mean, to the girls here, I would say, Praise God, there's nothing happening like that, but I'm just saying. I mean, you would meet a guy and he would be, oh, he would be the, he would be the person that you, you would want to be with. All the, that's, that's the kind of person that you want to marry. But he's not. But he's not. He would say, oh, I would raise you a kid like, you know, like, like believers. The only problem is he's not a, he's not a committed Christian. Compromise. Boys, I would say uh, the girl probably would be like Delilah or even Jezebel herself. What happened to Samson? Samson was disarmed, right? He was disarmed. And what happened to him eventually? I mean, you could give a, a you know, a, a rub of glory to the way he ended his life. I mean, he finished his, his stint being a judge. But that was a pathetic end. What happened to him? He lost his eyes. He was in the temple of Dagon. And he pushed the, uh, the pillars. And yeah, the beams came crashing down on him. It is true that he took down so many of uh, the enemies down with him. But that's not how a man of God is supposed to end his life. That's not how you, you and I should finish our lives. What was the reason? Compromise. So, I leave that thought, you know, to your minds. Let me move on. Um, so, compromises can have can can have consequences in various realms because of a marital relationship. And I know there are youngsters here; they are looking forward for uh, whenever whenever it is God's time. I know they were probably some of them are early to think about it, but I'm just saying. If, if you are take, making the wrong choice, then you will end up seriously in a big trouble. Like Jehoshaphat ended himself in. He got himself killed, right? A, a wrong spiritual relationship also is possible because of compromise. Jehoshaphat, take, him, take his case. What happened to him? He was sitting with the people, with, with a bunch of uh, you know, prophets, supposedly prophets who are not men of God. And this happened just before the battle that I just mentioned. They were sitting in, the, in that council and those men were not the men of God. And one prophet, Micaiah, he came in. He spoke the word. He spoke the word that he received from the Lord. What happened to him? He was silenced. He was slapped left, right on his face and put behind the bars. Ahab had to, sorry, Je Jehoshaphat had to be a witness of the thing. I don't know what was going through his mind at that point of time, but immediately he, he, he left, he left into the battlefield with Ahab and the whole thing happened. See, this is the kind of uh, situation that we would end up in if, if compromises happen. So a word of caution to the church here, to my sisters, to my brothers here, be alert. Be alert. Let's not make any compromise in any part of our life. Now, I'm also stepping up, you know, step one step further and saying, if you have, if you have compromised, please, I plead with you, for the love of God, come back, come back, ask for His forgiveness. Also, also. 
if you feel in your heart, in your spirit, that you've been disciplined by the Lord, say thank you, Lord. This is from a mistake that you're disciplining me. This is for, for my good. Give me the strength to endure. Okay? So there are three things I, I, I spoke. One is do not compromise. If you have compromised, let us ask God for the heart of repentance. The third one, if you are going through some chastisement or, or, or disciplining, <coughs> ask the Lord to give you the strength to endure so that you can live with a life telling this is for my good. Okay, there are three things I spoke about in the remedial part about compromise. Now you may think, well, you know, what I'm just saying is a little harsh, too much for you know, our minds to grasp. Stay with me, you know, I just as I finish my thoughts, Few more, a few more thoughts actually. Is God harsh to us because you know his disciplining is heavy on us? I mean maybe we are not going through any of that, that, kind, that kind of stuff in our life right now. But let me put it very clearly, clearly and bluntly before you. He is not at all, he is not at all compromising from his end because he is a jealous God. He will make sure that his name will not be maligned. Okay, so as Christians, as people of God, let us always understand that there is a, there is a responsibility on us to keep up to that name. If we don't do that, then there would be severe consequences. Now you might say, is this a message of grace? Of course it is a message of grace. I'll prove it to you from one life from the example of one life, again from the life of David. What happened to him? You know the story. You know the story. You know the whole story about what he did, what he did with Bathsheba. The entire, I'm not, I'm not describing it. It was a grave thing. It was, a, it, was, it was the cheapest, the lowest step any man can go to. He schemed. Right? He he flouted, I mean, I would say he, uh, he broke three commandments of the Lord straight away. Covet this, do not covet, do not commit adultery, do not murder. He committed all the three. And in, in succession, because he had, to, he had to protect one, so he committed another, he broke another. Then in, in order to protect that one, he committed the third one, he, he broke the third one so on and so forth. So the moment you start that, that road down on the road to compromise or on the road of compromise, you keep breaking laws. Whereas it was a simple thing that, that he could do, he could have done. He should not have dodged his duties and stayed back at his home, right? He, he committed all of those. It's long story short, Uriah dies, Bathsheba becomes his wife, a year passes by, a child is born. What happened to him? God waited for that year, you know, till the child was born. Then comes along Nathan, Prophet Nathan. What did he say? Because you have done this detestable thing in the Lord's sight, the Lord is going to punish you. Okay? The Lord is going to punish you. Just look at the backdrop. Just look at the backdrop. David was living in the times of the law, correct? According to the law, what was he, what was he completely, you know, entitled? I mean, he was entitled to be stoned to death for whatever he has done. Now, why would I say that? Was it a secret that only David and Bathsheba knew? We would be foolish if we think, oh, we, those two people knew. Sorry. There were eyes who saw Bathsheba being sneaked in. There were people who thought, who thought, what, what happened to him? What happened to Uriah? And why is Bathsheba suddenly the king? Oh, there were people talking. There were also people talking, not only in Israel, but outside Israel, the Lord's enemies, and as, you know, in, in, some, in some words, the writers of the Old Testament would, would put, they were also saying, aha, 
So that God is a, uh, is a, is a partial God. He, 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 he's, not, he's not just. Nathan comes, tells David at his face about his sin. David understands his mistake. He all the time knew it, but now he was exposed. He breaks down. He asks the Lord's forgiveness. And you know what happened? That is, that is the message of grace in the Old Testament. I'm saying, I'll tell you why. What does Nathan say from the Lord? After he receives us, after he receives God's word on that, I'm saying, your sins are forgiven. Whereas, according to the standard of the time, he and the woman should have been stoned to death. Do you see, don't you see God's grace there? He is a gracious God even when we think it's the time of law. He was always a God of grace. But then, the next part. But your child will surely die. Why would God, why would God have to do that? Have you ever thought? Now you might say, oh, that was a very cruel part of God to have taken the innocent child. What did the child do? What did the child do? Now we are missing a, a, a you know a big truth here. Let's understand before God whether you are like dead or alive. It is the same. So, whether the child dead or alive, it was the same before God. That child that was born to David was always ever present before him, even in body or otherwise. So it doesn't matter whether God takes his life or allows the boy to live. But actually, let me tell you, God was actually sparing the boy of a great deal of nonsense that he would deal in his childhood or in his youth. Imagine the scenario, he's walking through the palace, on through the, through the corridors and somebody would say, there goes the child of adultery. Can you imagine what would have gone through that boy's heart? He actually was gracious in taking the child away. So, if we are thinking God was cruel at that point, sorry, he was not. He was gracious, he was always, he is rich in mercy, we do not understand it, that's the problem. I am making a strong case here, when we say God is gracious, even when it hurts, okay? But, in the, way, in the, in the vision or in the sight of the people of Israel, who were watching David and, and his family, how did that translate to the people? Oh yes. Finally, God did something. You understand? The point is, when he compromised, there was a consequence. And when he compromised, and there was a moment in David's life which caused the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, God was always jealous and he made it a point that he brought down that justice upon his house. David understood it and understood that and he came to terms with it. And that's the heart of David. You know, he is, he is he's called a man after my own heart, right? God says he's, David is man, he's, he's a man after my own heart. You understand the gravity of what I'm trying to, you know, drive at the point I'm trying to drive at. Similarly is the case with Moses. Moses, he, he when he was asked to speak to the rock. What did he do? He struck the rock thrice. It's very interesting in that conversation that he has with Moses. Because you did this, I, I, I told you to just speak to the rock. But what did you do? You struck and then what it actually meant is God, uh, Moses was despising God's word, commandment. That commandment was at least known to a few people and Moses was like rebelling. God did not let his name be maligned by being so nice to Moses. It is a very serious thing when compromises happen. Okay, you cannot do that. If you do and if there is a question of God's name being maligned, be sure there is something coming. It's only for his glory. If he spares, he's, he's truly the merciful God. We do not know. We do not know. Okay, yeah. 
the second part. It, it would be unfair for me to just speak about the Old Testament. I should also speak about the New Testament too. We know about uh, the God in the New Testament as a loving God, as a gracious God. Yeah, he is. But then he was the same God who took out Ananias and Sapphira. When did that happen? During the time of Moses? No. Just after Jesus had risen from the, from the dead, he had gone up, the church began to thrive, and these two, the couple, they conspired and agreed upon a lie, right? The Holy Spirit exposed them, and because the name of the Lord to the church and around was being maligned because of them, God took them down. So we need to understand the God of yesterday, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he was the just God yesterday, he is the just God today, and he will be the just God tomorrow, in the next, in the next, in the, uh, forever. If he was the merciful God, he is the merciful God today, he will be the merciful God tomorrow. If he is the gracious God, he is the gracious God today, he will be the gracious God tomorrow. His character does not change. I hope I'm, I'm making myself very clear. So what do we do? Shall we resolve not to compromise in, 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 our, in the various areas of our lives? I'm coming to the last part. Okay, I'll just, I'll just read out a verse from the New Testament saying that he is, he's, he's, he's too much for us to handle. Hebrews 12, 29, what does it say? For our God is a consuming fire. Oh, he is a merciful God. He is a loving God. Of course he is. But the same word says he is a consuming fire. Let's be very careful with what we do before him. And you know, uh, you might say, okay, compromise is hota hai. Because the ways of God are so boring. Sorry. Let me tell you, Jesus said, follow me, my yoke is light. What I tell you to do is do our simple things. So let me conclude. The small instruction that God gives us is, you follow what I'm saying. It is for your goodness. It's for your life that I'm saying these. Read your word, read, read God's word, God's word. And this is a beautiful verse, probably we can, uh, we can, we can say as our prayer from, from the bottom of our hearts. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that, uh, that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. He wants us to have everlasting life. So, Let's be submissive to his small, sorry, still small voice. And let's be ready to take up the yoke that is not heavy, very light, the small instructions that God has given us in his word. Okay? Shall we, I mean, can we, can we resolve not to compromise in our lives, even the slightest? Because the slightest are the pores through which, you know, can ruin you. It can, it can bring the bridge down. Okay. Shall we take a, shall we take a resolve in our lives today not to, not to compromise in any aspect of our life, any area, be it about to choosing our future, you know, our career, our life partner, you know, our, our businesses, our alliances with people. Let's be very careful. Let's search our hearts. Let's ask God His advice for our lives.